Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Last week we're saying, don't worry, be happy. Today, don't worry, God's got this. Don't worry, let me hear you say, don't worry, God's got this. Now turn to somebody and tell them, don't worry, God's got this. Turn back and say, I mean that. Because we can forget sometimes. We can get caught up and forget that God's already in control of everything. In fact, if we would look back over our lives and go through history, it would tell us that God has been there on every leaning side. There are times when you didn't know it, but God was intervening and sending angels and camped around you. While you slept, there was angels around you and God kept harm away from you. God's got you in the palm of his hands. You'll find that there are things that could have happened to you, but God caused you to go a little bit later than usual and you missed some situations. Illness couldn't take you out. The accident didn't take you out. All other adversities didn't take you out because God was whispering in your ear, don't worry, I've got you. I've got you. If we can just be still and know one thing, that God's got it. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, God brought them out with great miracles. They saw the hand of God move in so many ways. And as soon as they went through the Red Sea on dry land, they got across and they began to complain. Why do we do that? We complain after all that God does. Rather than being more confident in our faith increasing, we choose to complain. God, I know you could do that back there, but this is different. You know, I, I know, I know, God, you poured the Red Sea. I know you gave us manna from heaven, but this, this is hard. This was a big one, God. And we wonder if God is still in control. I want you to know that God is always, always in control. Amen? No reason for us to complain as if God forgot about you or God's absent or God's on vacation. God says, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. God's got this. God's got this. There was one mother who was playing with her son out of the ocean and, 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 the, and the wave came and swept him out. And she was crying and pleading for help and no one could help her. And finally she said, Lord, help me. And God sent a wave and wa washed him back to the shore. And she picked him up and he was coughing and spitting a little bit and he was okay. Then she looked up, she says, he had a hat, you know. <laughs> if we don't learn from history, we will repeat it, won't we? If you don't know that God had you back then, God's got you today, and even the stuff that you haven't gotten to yet, God says, I've got that covered also. It was all covered by the blood of Jesus. History will tell us if God didn't stop, nothing, the miracles didn't end 2,000 years ago. The same miracles that was available then are available to us today. Do you believe that? We should be able to walk in miracle manifestations every day. A miracle should happen in us every day. Expect the miraculous to happen. I was listening to T.D. Jakes recount a story that every morning at 6.30, he's at a certain place in his house where his driver picks him up, 6.30. But one morning, he was running a little bit late and he was rushing because he knew the driver would be there for him. But at 6.30 in the morning, that exact time when he would be at this certain place, an explosion happened at his house at that very place. And had he been on time, we would not know him as he is today. You see, God delayed him because God knew something was coming up. God says, don't worry about this little delay, I've got you. Sometimes things are not happening in your time frame and God may be doing this on your behalf. You want to rush into it, but God says, just be still and know that I am God. Anything that's worthwhile sometimes takes a while, doesn't it? We try to rush. Some things just takes a course of action and when we're going through that course, it's God's course and not ours. It's God's, God's time and not our time. Because we want it when? Now. 
Now, RNJ, right now, Jesus. I need it right now. In fact, it's already late. Isaiah chapter number 30 and verse number 20 and verse number 21. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. Let's look back at that scripture again. And though the Lord gives you, the Lord gives you adversity and affliction. And he likens it unto bread and water. That means you're sustained sometimes by the affliction and adversity that God is giving you. God, I don't want this. But God knows what we need. And sometimes those helps us to develop and grow and mature in areas where we're weak. Adversity is like the, the wind that pushes against the kite but causes the kite to rise. Adversity is the mother of progress. It reveals character. It introduces a man to himself. And through adversity, God will lead you. And God said, though you go through the the water of affliction and the bread of adversity he says, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner. Don't take your adversity and put it aside and say, I'm so glad that's over. I'm so glad that's done. Stop. Go back. He says, you shall see the eyes of your teachers because your adversity was there to teach you something. So you meant to stop and go back and take a look at what it was that you missed. Because sometimes we missed a few things. Trying to get through it, we missed what we were trying to learn, meant to learn from it. We just want to get out of it. But if you look back, there was a lesson in the adversity. And we meant to take the lesson and disregard the experience, but so often we take the experience and forget about the lesson. And the experience tells us never to do that again, but the lesson tells us how to do it. So when you're going through adversity, learn the lesson. Let your teachers teach you. And then he says, and your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. This is the way. Lord, there's got to be another way. Lord, give me another way. This is the way. You don't like it, but this is the way that you've got to go through it. This is what you have to endure. This is what you have to suffer. God knows where you are. He said, be, be still and walk in it. I'm with you. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil because what? I am with you. But you will walk through it. This is the way you're meant to go. There's another way, God. God, there must be another way. Jesus said, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but let your will be done. This is the way, walk in it. And then it says, whenever you turn to the right hand or to the left, while you're walking, in other words, you have to be moving for, before God steers you. We want to be still in God. Give me the whole plan. God says, you take a step and I'll meet you at the next step. We want God to show first. God says, I already know. And if you trusted me, you just believe and take a step based upon your faith and belief in him. You're not believing in what you don't know. You're believing in the God that you do know. And you know that he knows everything. So you're taking a step of faith knowing that God already knows the direction. And if you go a wrong direction, God will steer you the right way. Is that right? If you turn a wrong direction, God will steer you. But he wants you to move by faith. We walk by what? And not by sight. That means that when we're walking by faith, we do not go by what we see or what we hear. But we do move. We do go by faith. By faith. Look at uh, verse number, I'm going to go to another scripture, Isaiah 43, but, but I want to just share something with you. Uh, sometimes when you're going through storms, sometimes you're going through storms, God will calm the storm. But sometimes God lets the storm rage while he calms his children. Sometimes you want God to stop the storm. God says, I want the storm to go because I want to deal with you right now. Because God wants to calm you. When you ran inside and you all panicked, mama, mama's just, shh. Every house we ever lived in, 
before I moved away from the South was on blocks. We did not have one house we lived in that was on a solid foundation. So when a storm came, and these were real strong storms, you could hear the wind blowing around the house and under the house, and they weren't built very well, so you hear wind going through the house, and mom would put us all around in the living room, and she'd just say, shh. We had to be still, and we'd wait until the storm was over. Mama said, well, I can't control the storm, but I want to control you, because the storm makes us fearful. But the fear cannot get on the inside of us. See, as long as you don't allow the fear to, to embody you, then whatever happening around you, you can have peace. And Jesus said, in the midst of storms, I give you perfect peace. Shh, be still. While you're going through it, I've got this. When Jesus was in the boat and the winds were sweeping over and the waves were sweeping over the boat, Jesus was down in the, in the bowels of the ship and he was asleep on a pillow. And they woke him up saying, Jesus, don't you care that, that we drown? And he got up and he looked around and he rebuked his disciples and he just says, peace, be still. And the winds and the waves just And that's what he's telling you in the midst of your little storm. Just say, peace, be still. And the same power that Jesus had lives in us. We have the authority to speak the words that are not as though they are. Peace, be still. Tomorrow never comes. Oh, that's, that's tough for somebody. Tomorrow never comes. Uh, Fleetwood Mac had a song out, and I'm not going to sing it. But Fleetwood Mac had a song out that says, Don't Stop. Oh, you know that song? You know that? You weren't always in church? Don't. Stop thinking about tomorrow. Don't stop. It'll soon be here. It'll be even better than before. Yesterday's gone. Yesterday's gone. Not biblical. Not at all biblical. Please what Max says, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. But Jesus says in verse 34, take no thought about tomorrow. In other words, don't even think about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Sufficient to the day is its own trouble. We can wear ourselves out thinking about tomorrow. Let tomorrow's strength be reserved for tomorrow. Don't wear today's strength out on tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. Because today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. This is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. But when we got here, it wasn't tomorrow. It became today. So we keep pushing off our gratification or whatever it is that we're expecting, whatever our hope, we push it off tomorrow. It'll be a better day. Jesus shared in verse number 34. It says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. I take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for today is its own troubles. Leave tomorrow's strength to tomorrow. Don't worry about what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. I find with highly effective people, what they do is they plan. They don't have to worry about tomorrow because they've already got tomorrow planned. You know, Muhammad Ali uh, passed away a few weeks ago and they had his, his service on Friday. He planned it several years ago. Every detail who was going to be there, who was going to speak, where it was going to be. He planned every detail about his own funeral arrangements. When you think about the worry, it many times it comes from poor planning. Those five Ps, remember? Proper planning prevents poor performance. If we would plan well, we won't have to worry about it. We have an uncle called Uncle Marlon. Uncle Marlon is in his, well into his 90s now. And he lived a very simple life. And I'm adopting that as I get a little bit older. Every pair of his pants were khaki. He had about 100 pair of khaki pants in there. And he would just, we had a few different shirts he'd wear. Very simple life. And years ago, there were a lot of friends he would hang around with. And, and, and they would be watching the game. And he would watch the game, but he's reading the paper. 
He was always a little bit different. And they always complained, Marlon, you're so rigid. He's still alive. All of them, gone. They lived hard. He lived easy. If you have a choice, let's do it easy, right? Easy like Sunday morning. Just do it easy. We try to, we make things hard and it increases our worry and frustration because we figure we got, we rush to do it now. We rush to tomorrow. Rather just taking our time. Tomorrow will come. Let's enjoy today. Does that make sense? Let's enjoy today. Let's get the best of what we can today. There was one lady that uh, she planned everything and she had four marriages in her life and a friend of hers watched her go through each one of the marriages. The first marriage was to a millionaire. The second one was to an, an entertainer. The third one was to a minister. And the fourth was a mortician. A friend asked her, said, you know, I know you do things in order, but explain to me this. She says, one for the money, two for the show. How many have been to the Grand Canyon? Raise your hand if you've been to the Grand Canyon. That's wonderful. Did you know a lot of people that live here have never gone to the Grand Canyon? Never, I mean, never made the plans. Not because it's moved or anything, it's they just never made the plans. And sometimes things don't happen because we just don't plan for it. We plan and that allows the avenue for things to happen. And if we don't plan, then circumstance and happenstance happens and we complain about what's going on. But we could have a plan that could negate a lot of the situations that have happened in our lives. Proper planning prevents poor performance. Seek God and his righteousness. Seek God and his righteousness. In verse number 33, therefore seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Seek first. And God said there's a priority that should be. And first priority should be God. Not when you have a need, you shift him into priority. He should always be a priority. His word shall continually be in your mouth. You wake up in the morning with your mind stayed on Jesus. Every day there should be a priority. Prayer should be a priority. Reading the word should be a priority. Living a spiritual life should be a priority. It shouldn't be something that you think about and try to remember to do. It should just, just be automatic. You get up in the morning and you fall down on your knees. You give God glory. You give God praise. So that when the need arises, you don't have to stop and pray. You've already prayed up. We stop sometimes and we want to pray God into every situation. But if you're always in communion with God, he's always with you. He's always abounding with you no matter where you are. He's always with us. And we want to have that kind of touch with him where we know that he's always there. Always. You have friends, no doubt, who call when they need something. Only when they need something. You can tell by the way the phone rings, it's them. <laughs> Hello? Hey, man, what's up? What you need? <laughs> oh, come on, man. What you need? I got to go. What you need? Well, my car broke down. I need $357.32. How much do you have? 32 cents. And that's how it is. And you don't see them again until there's a need. It shouldn't be that way with God. When every time we pray, God's like, what do you need? God, this is Jimmy, and I'll take whatever you give me. Right? Always a need. Hands out to God. Praise is not with your hands out. Praise is with your hands up. That's how we praise God, with our hands up. That's a surrender. When you, when you go out with your hands up, that means you're surrendering, right? So when your hands are up in praise, you say, God, I surrender all to you. That's why we praise our hands up. I surrender. We don't come to God saying, oh, God, I want to thank you for where you are. Maybe something's over here. We're just going over with our hands held out. God knows the difference. Seek his face, not his hands. Seek God as a priority. Seek first the kingdom. And he says, in all of these things, and God knows what those things are before we know. God knows what you have need of before we even ask. It's like with your parents. They know when you're coming what you need. They know you. And God knows you. So we come pleading to God for mercy. We should know that we should have confidence when we come. 
We should know that he hears us. We should have the faith to know that he hears us. And he's never leaving us. He'll never forsake us. No matter where we are. When God asked King Solomon, ask me for anything and I'll give it. That's a big one, isn't it? Ask me for anything and I will give it. What would you ask God for? Whoo, that's a blank check, isn't it? Ask me for anything. Ask me for anything. And Solomon could have asked for riches. He could have asked for power. He could have asked for wisdom. Uh, uh, but he asked for the thing that pleased God, which was wisdom to rule his people. So when God listens to you, he's listening for what you're not asking for. Because Solomon did not ask God for wealth, he did not ask God for power, he did not ask God for all those things. Because he asked God for wisdom to rule his people, God says, because you asked me for that, what pleases me, and not for what was yours, I will give you not just what you asked for, but all of these things that you didn't ask for will be yours. That's God, isn't it? It's sometimes not what we ask for. It's the thing that we're not asking for that moves God. Because we can always petition and ask God. But can we just stop and give God just praise? Serious praise. Just honoring God for who he is right now praise. Just have a praise moment. Whatever you're doing, just stand up and just want to give God praise. Just, for, just right now praise. Do you ever just feel like that? Because sometimes an issue comes up, we need it right now. God may say, look, I need some praise right now from you. What do we do when God's prompting your heart to praise? And it's not a good place. God, not here. It's not a good place to praise you. There was a lady who used to praise God in church, and some of the people were disturbed because it wasn't that kind of church. We don't do that in here. And she would just be back just praising God and giving God glory. And they decided they had to do something about that. So they saw in the grocery store, some of the mothers, those sisters saw in the grocery store and said, can we have a talk with you? And she started telling them how good God is. And what he's done for her. And she said, tell you what, if you can't let me praise there, maybe I can praise him right here. And she started giving God praise right there in the frozen food section. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta give God praise wherever the praise is necessary. Some of us are in a place where we need to praise our way through it. You're, you're in a place where it's a praise that needs to come out of you because the Bible says God inhabits the praise of his people. So when we release the praise, God comes in where the praise was. See, praise is a placeholder. And when you let go of the praise, the blessing comes down where the praise went up. It's not a matter of choosing a safe place to praise God. There's no safe place. In the middle of wherever you are, just give God glory. Just give him praise. Right there, you could be at 35,000 feet in a plane. You just just get, get yourself a little praise party with God. Because God understands. Don't withhold the very thing that God is trying to get you to release. And you're praying in your own way. It's just not my personality. I just don't do it that way. But you get over there with the game, you're just jumping up and down at the game. Huh? You go to your favorite event, you're jumping up and down. But I just don't praise that way. God knows the difference, right? He knows how high you can jump. He knows how high you'll jump for him. We should jump the highest for him, isn't that right? We should jump the highest, we should shout the loudest for him. We should clap the most for him. We should give him the highest honor and the highest praise. Don't say it for your favorite team or your favorite entertainer or your favorite song. You should just be able to let God just move you because that's the God that we know and serve. Give God a round of praise. Let's just give him a round of praise. God brings the increase, God brings the increase, but we have to wait on it. The difficulty and the struggles, we have to wait on God, and sometimes God seems so slow, doesn't he? Oh, God, slow, but God is a right on time God. May not be there when you want him, but he's always what? Right on time. Because his timing is not our timing, his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways. The Bible says, as far as the heaven is from the earth, so are God's ways from our ways and his thoughts from our thoughts. God has perfect time. But then in Isaiah 40 and 31, 
I love this verse, but those who wait on the Lord, I got that, those, because not everybody can wait, but for those who can wait on him, the Bible says he shall renew your strength, that you shall mount up with wings like eagles. You shall not be weary, and you shall walk and shall not faint. That's God. Wait on him. Though he tarries, wait. God has perfect timing. Just be patient and wait on him. Our oldest son, Ali, and I, I, I thought he would be here and I would, would share, but Ali had, had to, some changes in his job over the last few weeks. He works in the restaurant industry and one restaurant was closing for remodeling and left him with one job. And then with summer coming, the hours were cut back. So he was in a, a difficult situation. So he was gonna go to this job fair, but he wasn't sure, but he got up and he went anyway. He says that when he got to the job fair, he went to the interview and he sat down with one of the persons who, who uh, was a hiring manager at, at a restaurant. And he asked Ali about his experience. And Ali started sharing where he had worked and the managers and the people he knew, and it's the same people that the guy knew personally and had worked with. And he says, if you have worked with all of these people and have worked that long at these places, I know you'll work for us. He hired him on the spot. He says, I'll give you as many hours as you want. He went there and he was, Dad, I don't know what's gonna happen, you know, I'm, I, my rent's due, and he was talking about all the struggles that he had, but God's got it. Is that right? God's got it. Whatever your drought, wherever you're in the middle of, he knows. He knows, but in that journey between not having and receiving, that's what trust comes in. You have to trust him in the storm. On the other side, you just easy to say, oh yeah, I knew God had it. But when you're going through it, do you really know that he's got you? When you don't hear what you want to hear and don't see what you want to see. In your spirit, you've got to hear God saying, this is the way. Walk in it. I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Walk in it. This is the way. The prophet Elijah was giving kings the prophecy that God gave them. And they didn't like Elijah. When somebody's telling you what thus says the Lord, sometimes you don't want to hear what God has to say. You want to hear what you want to hear. But as they were going through, the prophet started to hide because he knew the kings were coming after him. And that morning, when the, the kings found out where Elisha was, and they sent an army, a whole army to go and attack one man because they did not want to hear what God had to say. That morning, they woke up and the servant went out. And the servant looked around and all he could see was the army he went back inside and he told Elisha, we're doomed. They're here for us. There's nothing that we can, there's nothing that we can do. And Elisha went out and he looked around, but he saw something differently. He saw something differently and he said to his servant, he says, but there's more with us than there are with him. And his servant was looking around saying, And sometimes we can feel outnumbered because of what we see and what we hear and what they say. And then Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes so that he can see. And God opened the servant's eyes. Now these are a different set of eyes. You got your physical eyesight, then you got your spiritual eyesight. And that spirit allows you to see what you cannot see in your natural. And that's what we want to see. You want to see what God sees in you and for you. What is greater? When God opened the servant's eyes, he saw an army of angels with fire and chariots all around them. Our confidence doesn't come from what we see. Our confidence comes from what we cannot see and what God's word has already said. And I can imagine that servant was saying, God's got this. <laughs> From
from weeping to worshiping is just a matter of influence, of knowing that God's got you. You can have a pity party or you can have a praise party. Your head can be down or your head can be lifted up, knowing that God has got this. In the middle of it all, it's time to praise him. God's telling you and I, I've got you. King David said, I look to the hills from where comes my help. My help comes from the Lord. God's got you. Though you weary, yet will you trust him. God's got you. Job says, though the skin falls from my bones, yet in my flesh I shall see God. God's got you. The weary cease from trouble and the wicked will be at rest because God's got you. And no matter where you go, no matter where you stray, you go to the ends of the earth, God is there. Though you make your bed in places unknown, God is there because he's got you. Today, I want you to know that we may not be in a perfect place, but we have a perfect God. And whatever may come, we gotta start having more confidence. We gotta start speaking in the midst of that storm. Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus because God has got this. There is no condemnation because God has got you in the palm of his hands. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. God's got this. God's got this. God's got this. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, for.